Fox, and today, Pud, Ginger, and I have come up to Boston, Massachusetts, to the Boston Naval Shipyard to see a forge in operation. Now, you know, Pud and Ginger, forges have been important to men for many, many years. You remember the poem about the village smith under the spreading chestnut tree? He was working in a forge. Matter of fact, they go back about 3,000 years, I think. Something of that sort, anyway. Now, here at this forge and chain shop in the Navy Yard that we're in. They make all kinds of chains, and the thing that they make that's the biggest are the anchor chains that hold super aircraft carriers like the USS Saratoga. Now, when they drop anchor, there's a tremendous amount of pull exerted by the winds and the tides on the anchor chains and the links, and they have to be strong, they have to be dependable, and they are made so that they are right here. Now, what, we better get out of the way here, I think, because... Here comes a truck, and we have to watch ourselves, Pud and Ginger, in this shot, because there are many, many things going on here, and we've really got to be careful. Now, Mr. Paul Ivis is a master mechanic here at the shop. That means he's in charge of the Ford shop. He's going to be showing us around. Hi, Paul. Hi, Pud. Hi, Ginger. Hi, Here are the goggles and hand hat for you, and oh, the goggles and hand hat for you. And we got a goggles and hand hat for you, Sonny. We want to make sure that nothing happens to your eyes. Everybody in the shop has to wear these safety glasses. Whoops. Nice. Well, I was telling Ginger and well, Bud that... Um, is this like a uh, blacksmith shop? Oh, you mean Long Smelt, Longfellow's Village Smithy? Yeah. Yeah, well, we're just like them, but we've grown up in the years since then. What he used to do by hand, now we do with large power equipment, hammers and presses. Well, is forging the only way you have of, of shaping metal? No, there are three general ways of shaping metal. One is by casting, where you take the molten metal and pour it into a mold, just like your mother does when she makes a cake. She takes the batter and pours it into the cupcake mold. Then you have stamping, where you take sheet metal and press it out into a shape and form. And then we have forging, where you take it like a snowball and compact it. Well, we think forging is. Is that what's Here going on behind us? That's right. Over here, they're making a two-inch bolt. See what the hammer is doing? It's just like making the snowball, squeezing and compacting the metal, making it longer. Well, I notice one difference between this and the snowball. This is red and hot. Is yeah. that what you have to do to metal in order to make it uh, malleable, pliable? That's right. The forging process requires that the material be heated up until it's plastic so that it can be worked. Yes, that's what we use to make the anchor chain for the socket member of the anchor chain. Is it very heavy? Oh, these pieces weigh 270 pounds. Can I try and pick one up? You can try the small one, bud. All right. Oh. Well, what are those big ones over there? Oh, these are the long bars that are used to be cut up to make these shot pieces here. They're being placed in the power hacksaw. Yes, we saw those. Special steel contains tungsten. You're really going to try to saw all three of these bars at once, huh? Yes, that's what we do. We saw three cuts at one time. Does it take very long? It takes about 15 minutes to cut these three pieces. Not long. What's that oil like coming out? We call that the coolant. That's a 
water mixed with a chemical. The chemical only prevents the water from rusting. It keeps the saw blade cool. Now what we're doing here, Paul, is cutting off these bars into the proper lengths, and later on they'll become the links in the anchor chain. That's right, the half section, the socket of the anchor chain. Oh, there's only half of it. That's right, the half, the half length, the socket. Now over here I see you have one that's almost all completely sawed through. That's right, that one's just about finished cut. That will be the one half piece that we're going to make today in the anchor chain, the socket. What happens to the pieces after they've been sawed off? Well, we have a demonstration board over here, Ginger, that shows exactly what takes place. You see, we call it dialogue chain. And it's made in two half sections, one called the stem, the other the socket. The stem is sheared or sawed from the bar, and the socket the same way is either sheared or uh, saw it from the bar. The stem, the ends are rolled, pointed, bent into a U. The socket is bent into a U. Then we take the stem member, it's placed in dies, and the impressions are forged on the stem member, making these little buttons. The socket, after the U has been bent, it's heated, and the punches come forward, forming the cavities here and this cross piece called the stud. The stem fits directly into the socket, as you see here. It's been cut away to show exactly what occurs. Then it's placed in dies, and the hammer forces the material around these buttons to this close union here. Today we're going to show you what we're doing in the socket member, this point here. We'll follow this half through. The one that becomes the U and then the A, really. That's right. We change the alphabet, the U to the A. Oh. Now, what do you do with this cold piece of metal here? What's the first step toward turning it into an anchor chain? Well, the first step is an all forge forging requires that it be heated. So the first thing is we take this bar, place it into a furnace, bring it up to the proper temperature so it's plastic enough be shaped. Now I see you have a number of these furnaces around. Yes, in forging practices, furnaces are required throughout the entire process. Well, how hot are those furnaces? Well, these particular furnaces are running at 2100 degrees Fahrenheit. Right one, Looks like, <laughs> I don't know, what does it look like? A birthday cake. That's exactly what it looks like. I just realized that. Now, here goes that cold piece of metal we just saw sawed into a furnace. How long does it stay in there? Well, it takes about 40 minutes to heat it up, but we won't have to wait that long today. Here's one coming in out now. Boy, that sure is red hot. It's being placed into a bending machine. Look at that thing bend. Boy, does it take much pressure to bend that? Yes, this machine requires about 100 tons of pressure to bend wow, that into the U. Tons? That's right, 100 tons. And there it goes, being shoved the rest of the way. And now we've taken that single straight bar that weighed how much? 270 pounds. And just like that, bent it to a U. Yes, it has to be hot. It has to be heated again. Oh, just like, uh, just like when we took a trip to Corning Glass. The glass had to be uh, reheated again. Well, as in steel and in glass, with proper temperature, that has a great deal to do with your finished product. It has to be plastic at all times so that it can be properly worked. Another one of those sword pieces getting ready to be heated. What are these furnaces burn? All oh, these furnaces burn oil, just like your furnace at home. How much oil do they burn? Well, this furnace burns about three gallons a minute.
Now, in this second furnace that it's going into, uh, how long do you have to keep it in there to reheat it? Well, we only have to take about three minutes to bring it up to the proper temperature because, you see, it's already hot. Now, we've got it into the form of the A, which is the first step in the socket. What happens now? Well, we have the U, now we're gonna take it and make it into an A. What it is, it's placed into the upsetter, into a set of dies, that squeeze and hold the piece, and then we have the punches coming forward to displace the material to form the hole so that it will fit onto the socket, the socket will fit onto the stem. right. <laughs> That's exactly what it looks like. Now it should look like an A. What uh, what have you got down here? Well, here's how this piece is bent and made into the U, placed in these dies which are in that machine. Then the punches come forward to form the hole and go across here to form that cross piece, just as you see it here. See those holes, Bud, Mister? That's what the socket will go into to make the rest of the link. That's right. That's called the first pass. The second pass finishes it, which we have over here. And that's fitted right over the stem. It's heated in place right over the stem. Let's, um, I see they're bringing out another U there and putting it into the upsetter. Now, these are the dies that are in that machine. That's right. Now, when you've got them into this form, is it time now to put them together? Yes, this is the locking or assembly operation wherein the socket is joined with the stem. There's the socket going right over the stem member. And these are going to be squeezed together, right? That's right. Okay, hammer. now let's watch this hammer squeeze these two pieces together. About 30 million pounds. Oh, I hate to get my hand caught in that. Indeed, you'd lose it very quickly. Now the link has been placed into the trimming press. In the trimming press, we take off the excess material. Just like your mother when she bakes a pie, she's got to trim around the edge of it. And that's what we're doing in this machine here. Now, Putin Ginger, notice that the link is just one of many links. The chain grows link by link. You don't make the link separately. The links are, of course, joined before they're put together. They'll never come apart, we hope. Now, there's the stem, that member that we haven't seen being manufactured. And that's cold, apparently. Paul, is that stem cold? Yes, that stays cold for the process there. It's the socket that is heated up and placed directly over the so uh, stem. Here comes another socket, and they're ready to make another link.
lengths does it take to make an anchor chain? Well, an anchor chain is made up in shots. A shot is 90 feet long. What do you call a shot? Well, nobody really knows where they got the name of a shot, but it's been determined to make it 90 feet long. And how many shots? <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Losing my voice in there. How many shots of anchor chain does it take to outfit a super carrier? It takes 24 shots of anchor chain to outfit one saw carrier. Quick, 24 times 57. 1268. You need an abacus. Now there goes another link being formed. You saw the stem going through the hot link that was just forged. And it's waiting for the Sockets are going to be placed directly on that stem member again. Then the hammer blows come down and force that material around the buttons in the dies. That's where we get the name die lock. as it goes up over the pulley. And you'll be able to see how many links there are so far that have been completed in this chain. the man who operates the crane. What do you call this? A boom. Boom. And take a look up there, link after link, going up all the way over and down here. Ginger, see that? And oh, but <laughs> is over by a pile there of, of uh, chain just sitting there. Pat, how many uh, shots of chain do you guess? Oh, let's see. About five shots? No, only three. Pat and Ginger, I'd like you to meet somebody in our shop who knows more about anchor chain because he's made quite a bit of it ever since he's been a young fella. Bill Homer. Ah, here he is now. Here's Bill. Bill, how are you? Bill, uh, I hear tell that you've been doing uh, making anchor chains for quite a while. Since 1909, 47 years ago. Wow! Where did you begin? I started in Cradley Heath, about six miles from Birmingham, England. What was it like in those days? Well, it seemed as though it was all work. Everybody was busy making chain, or even the coal mine, or the steel mills. And that seemed to be all that was around us. Did you have machines? No machines, all by hand. No machines? No machines, all by hand. It's taken a long, long time. It took a long time to work. Well, did you have uh, youngsters working there? We had boys starting at the age of 14 when they left school. That's when I started, at the age of 14. 14? 14 years of age. How did you decide you wanted to go into making this? I decided because my brothers were chain makers, and my father and his father before him, and the whole family were chain makers. Well, even my mother could make chain. Even your mother? Even my mother and my grandmother. At that oh. time, why, there's all kinds of young girls just taking chain making up as a trade. Now, of course, we keep hearing that things that are made by hand are usually much better than things that are made by machine. How do you feel about chains? They were all right in their day, but today we've had so much progress that today I think we're at the end of progress. We've got a chain here today that is better than the material they can give to us because where we put it together will break any material they can give to us. In other words, you think what you're doing I here... Think today we're at the end of progress as far as chain is concerned. <laughs> Okay, Bill, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> now you can see the contrast, Putt and Ginger, between the way it used to be with people working with their hands in small shops, men, women, and little children, too, 
to the way it is here today at the Boston Naval Shipyard Forge and Chain Shop. Just take a look at this huge place with the machines, 25,000 pound and 10,000 pound hammers, the huge oil-fed furnaces, and compare it to the way it must have been when Bill Homer started out 47 years ago. when you finished making your link, when you finished making your shot of chain, what happens? It has to be inspected and tested. All the chain that we make is inspected and tested very thoroughly. Here are some men testing and inspecting the chain now. They're measuring it to see that it's the proper length. There's Mr. Jacobson over in the background who's in charge of this group. And what do you do? Do you stretch it to make sure it uh, won't break? What we do is we apply a proof load. The proof load is designed to show all the strength of the chain. In this case here, we apply a million seven hundred thousand pounds. A million? Oh. Does it ever break? No. This chain here, it breaks at two million eight hundred thousand pounds. But now you've got the links and of course they have to be attached to the anchor now what's going on here is that part of the making of the anchor yes we're making the anchor shank here what you've seen is the massive metal which we call a billet coming out of the furnace and being placed directly under the press this press is a thousand ton press huh? now how much how much is the material i see you've got part of it is hot and part of it is apparently not well that's a large piece of metal there. It weighs 40,000 pounds. The pot that's heated has to be counterbalanced by the pot that's cold. So you can just carry it around. That's right. Now this is actually squeezing it. Isn't there it, it is. It's taking it and squeezing it. Without, no, just a squeeze. And the idea is you have a big chunk of metal which you want to you are out into a long chunk, is that That's right? That's right, that was 32 inches square originally. Now it's being brought down gradually so we shape it out to the shank. This is like taking a big hunk of clay, Puddin' Ginger, in your hand, a big ball of it, and by squeezing it, and squeezing it, you get it out into a long worm. piece. A long worm, yeah. Well, this is a pretty big worm we're watching over here. How long does it take to heat the metal, this huge piece of metal? Well, in the original heat, it requires three days to bring it up to the proper three temperature. Days, That's days. right, three days. Now, is this another shank here? That's a finishing operation on a shank of the same type. What they are doing there is smoothing it down so it will look finished. They're finished, are they still squeezing it? No, they're, they're squeezing it, but not to the same extent. They're smoothing it out. You make the links and you make the shank of the anchor, which is the long, as you can see, metal piece. What about the prongs at the end? Well, those are called the flukes, and they are cast at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. Oh, you don't make those here? No, we don't. We just make the shank, the shackle, and assemble them. Oh, you assemble them all here, do we you? We assemble them and then test them before they're shipped. Oh, there's one that uh, looks like it hasn't quite been assembled yet. That's right. It shows the flukes, the shank, and it's being ground to take the spots off it so it'll be nice and smooth.
Americans will weigh 60,000 pounds when they're completed. Yeah, the world's largest anchor. Well, Putton Ginger, you're standing right now in the middle of one of these anchors. The chain that's been forged is down at the other end. Putt, why don't you try to stand on the fluke so we know which part that is. And that's the part that digs into the bottom of the sea, Ginger. You just pat the shank there so we can see that. And Paul, we'd like to thank you very, very much for letting us come down here to the Boston Naval Shipyard Forge and Chain <laughs> Shop and show us something that we really never uh, knew about and I don't think most of us ever thought about even. We'd like to also thank the men in the uh, shop here for letting us uh, see them at work on a Sunday. Well, we're glad to have you come in, Pud. Thank you very and much. Thank you very much. And we'll, we'll, turn, we'll turn our glasses and hats in on the way out. Paul. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well, now, Pud and Ginger, <clears throat> you know, ideas like this one uh, come very frequently in the mail. And so we keep on asking you to write in your suggestions. Even if you've written in one before, why don't you, if you have another idea, drop us another letter or a postcard. And what's the address, Jim? Let's take a trip. 485 Madison Avenue, New York, 22 New York. That is T-Rex. And Bud Ginger, next week we'll be back in New York, in Long Island City, to see the way sh the shoes that you wear are made. That's right children's shoes and it's a pretty fascinating process right from beginning when they cut out the letter to the end when they put in the last ditch that's next week five star shoe company in long island city i hope we'll see you then bye let's take a trip a trip is fun to take so pick the place you want to go and get what i make we can travel to a farm and see the farm and plow help to feed the horse Candy factory, we'll watch him work and then When they dip the chocolate, baby, sample nine or ten. Let's take a dip. A dip is what you get. Let's